Hey, YouTube, it's PB. Thanks for tuning in to another Life of a Jobbing Plumber. Been so busy, I think everybody's dead busy at the minute. I've done four boilers in a month, which is a lot for me, because I'm normally just jobbing around, fixing things. So the trouble with that is for me, one man band, when I'm on a job for a day, two days, all the other little stuff starts backing up. So I've just been all over the place. My head's full up. Um, job's coming out of my ears, but can't complain. And also, I've got a bit of an addiction to PUBG, Play, Player Unknown's Battleground on the Xbox. So, getting to about 10 o'clock at night, um, I'm having a couple of games on that, which is turned into three or four games. So, I'm getting to bed later and later, starting earlier in the morning to keep up with the work, but I'm enjoying myself. So, got uh, loads of jobs for you to look at this week. Hope you enjoy the video. Um, thanks for your support. And yeah, hope you enjoy it. Cheers, guys. Okay, quick toilet repair. Rocker system, so these are rocker parts. You know it's rocker because it's normally printed on there. And this one's letting water by. So just grab it and give it a twist. And it comes out. And then we'll look at that with we'll wash there because this will be the issue, the seal there. It's slightly curved and there's a bit of scum on it. So what we're gonna do is, because I've not got it on the van, we will just try and take this off, flip it upside down and put it back together and then the curve will be the opposite way, so hopefully that will seal, so I'm gonna try it now. Okay, so you see that now, the curve rather than going up is going down, so we'll put that back in. Okay, so back in, we'll let that fill up. And we'll see, the issue we had before, See that it's running into the pad. I'm just going to let the water build, level build up. Now it's totally up to you if you do this. So what I will do is I'll dry it off. And then I'll just check if, will, uh, if any water runs down. My finger's still dry. I'll keep looking at that for a few minutes, but I think that's done it. Because normally you can see a trickle, or you'll feel it onto your finger. So that's filling up now. Obviously, we can still quote for a new seal or even a new siphon, but if you want to get it fixed, work similar with tap washers on ceramic disc taps. Tech it out if you've not got one. Flip the washer the other way up because there'll be a, the good edge will be the other side. Um, tap washers, if you've not got a tap washer, for whatever reason, take it apart, flip it over, and sometimes that will get you out of the shit. Just a little tip. There we go. Right team, been called out to this Baxi Solo boiler. It's a heat only boiler, and they've got no heating or hot water. So the first thing I do is basically to try and make it work. So we're calling for central heating now, you can see there that the boiler is lighting and going out and then it will try to light again and go out again and most boilers will do this two or three times maybe even four and once it's decided that there's an issue where it's not staying lit it will go into lockout and that's the safety device of the boiler so you can see there the lockout light illuminates that's the boiler locked out and it won't work until it's been reset so if we look on the actual boiler itself that we've got three probes here. The first two, left and right, are the ignition probes. So they spark between each other to light the gas. And this thir third one is a flame rectification device. And that goes off to the PCB to tell the boiler that the gas has been lit. But you can see on this one, it's interrupted here by the condensed trap. So the first thing I'm gonna do is disconnect that. Then we reset the boiler and try again to see if it works. And what we're trying to do now is rule out one thing at a time because it could likely be that the rectification probe is burnt out, but we're trying things in a, in a certain order. So we can see here now, when we light the boiler, the flame comes on and it stays on. So straight away there, all we've done is unplug the cable, but we've identified the fault as being on the condensed trap. 
So we need to look at the condensed trap. Now you can't really tell from the video, but that condensed trap is completely full. So what will happen is when the condensed trap becomes blocked and fills up too much, it's a safety cutout that stops the boiler from lighting because if the boiler lights when the condensed trap's blocked and starts running and condensing, it's gonna produce more condensate. There's nowhere for it to go, so it backs up and floods the boiler. So we now followed the condensed pipe under the sink and you'll find this on a lot of new builds they take the condensed pipe internally, which is good because it's combating freezing condensed pipes on the outside. But when you take them into a kitchen sink like this, all the scum, the soap, stuff like that you normally associate with a kitchen sink can cause them to block. So all I've done there is moved the blockage slightly and released some of that backed up condensed water. I mean, you can tell you can see all this in the pipe anyway. This is what you would normally find in a kitchen waste pipe but when you're teeing in a, a condensed pipe it can quite easily get blocked because it's only a 20 mil pipe so we're basically cleaning this out releasing all that backed up condensed water and that will empty the condensed trap in the boiler on this model once it's emptied that can't normally it's not the end of it you have to dry it out or wait for it to dry out but here I'm just showing you I've plugged it back in we've drained the water out we know it's clear now and the boiler is going to light and stay lit. So I posted this video on Instagram about a week ago. Basically, I went to this property and I first fixed pipes for radiators. And the plasterer, or I don't know, for whatever reason, none of the pipes lined up. So on this one, it was particularly close. I um, uh, couldn't quite get a street elbow on it. Nothing really I could do, so I thought I'll try this back bender out on it. It just so happened that you can fit it in into tight spaces like this, and I managed to bend them up. Now, what I will say is it goes on all right, but once you've bent it, it's really hard to get it back off. But I did get it off. Um, I fell out of love with this back bender recently because it started kinking the pipes, but it don't always do it. It's really hard to tell what's going on with it. I think they've actually recalled them but it is a handy little tool for getting into spaces like this. Right guys, every now and then you'll get a job and you'll look at it and you'll think, how the am I gonna do that? And this is a particularly difficult one because, and this is similar to like if someone's fitted a bath and the taps are in the middle at the back of the bath. The pipes that run down here, you can't get to them because we've got the worktop in the way here, we've got the sink in the way here, and then we've got a cupboard. Now, the pipe work is at the back there, so what I've done is, I've disconnected, took the um, waste fit out of the sink, um, and it was glued, but I've managed to cut it, so we can slide this sink out of the way, just enough that we can get onto the pipe work. Now, it may be that you couldn't, you couldn't even do that and you had to get your arm up the back. In those situations you might need something like this um, Tapex kit from Narrow Tools. But even then it might be a struggle. So you might be tempted to think, right, I'll just leave these on and I'll screw the new tap straight on. Sometimes that will work, but on this model tap the nut is captive on the leg. On this old tap that came out, the nut was on the actual tap, so I can't even use these. Um, so we're going to have to take these out. So like I said, I've removed this sink. I'm just going to slide it as best I can so I can get my arm in there to work on it. And we'll stick these new legs in and do the tap. But yeah, sometimes you'll get a job like this. You'll just have to advise the customer, look, it's going to be really hard for me to get to this to do what you want to do. It's not just a case of old tap out, new tap in. It's going to be hard to actually work on it. And just give them the honest, um, you know, tell them the truth. It's going to be hard. It might take me two hours, might take me three hours. I might be on this all day, you know, swearing. My arm might be hanging off by the time I finished it. Um, and yeah, just let them know before you start because you can, you will get jobs like this that aren't normal jobs. Um, that's what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to get this tap fixed now and then I'll pop back on the video when I've done it to show you what I've done. All done. It's the new tap in, so we've got the new uh, legs there. The only thing is the um, this 
worked up has been stained or varnished so the old ones were slightly bigger you can see there a bit of a gap but they can sort that out so yeah just um undid that undid that slid that out of the way a bit managed to get to that one easy still had to struggle to get into that so i used the narad tapex kit to get into that it's quite handy for, for jobs like this where you don't come across them all the time but yeah that's it Hey guys, it's PB. Just a really quick video to show you some fault finding using a thermal imaging camera. So I've been called out to this combi boiler that's got hot water issues and we can see there on the image that the far left hand pipe, which is the central heating flow, and the second from left, which is the domestic hot water outlet, are both getting hot. As it's a combi boiler and we're drawing off hot water, there shouldn't be any heat going down the central heating flow. If we kill the power to the boiler and leave the tap running, we can see there that the domestic hot water pipe cools down but there's still some heat there left in the central heating flow. Popping the power back on, you'll see the hot pipe gets hot again, but more heat is then going into that central heating flow pipe and that confirms us the issue. Now this is the kind of fault you can identify just by touching the pipes, but that can be really difficult if when you get to the customer's house, the boiler's already been on and the pipes are quite warm. It's also a really useful tool to show your customer what's wrong with the boiler and explain to them what you're gonna do and why you're gonna do it. Just going to tell you a quick story about um, a job I did. It might go over some of yours heads who are not gas safe registered, but bear with me. So I fitted a new boiler, valent heat only, to a Gledil boiler mate. So if you don't know what one of those is, it's a thermal store. Basically you've got three pumps on the unit. You've got the primary pump which circulates the heat from the boiler to heat up the thermal store. You've got a central heating pump which when the room stack calls for heat, comes on pumps the heat around the house and then you've got a third pump which is for the hot water so basically it circulates through a plate heat exchanger when you open the tap runs through the plate heat exchanger the water gets hot so I fitted this um, 412 it was heat only boiler and it only had three wires to it. it had switch live neutral and earth so I thought in common sense in my head was take a permanent live there to the boiler because it's a condensing boiler it's got a circuit board it's got a display so i took four wires to it permanent live so the boiler was always on in sort of standby neutral and earth when it got a switch live the boiler fired up but it kept getting a fault it was the differentials between the flow and return the temperatures weren't quite right so i called valent technical they sent an engineer out and apparently I didn't need the fourth wire, didn't want this permanent live. It was absolutely fine to run this boiler with three wires. So when the switch live came on, the boiler got the powers if you were turning on at the wall, went through its sort of checks, diagnosis, and then it would fire, which I thought would be the wrong way to do it. I thought that would damage the boiler, you know, having to come on. It was almost as if it was having a power cut and then coming back on. But because the boiler was on the permanent live that I'd give it, when the Gledil boiler mate called for heat, it was so instant that the boiler fired up, it was messing around with the flow and return temperatures. So the guy came out and said, look, just get rid of the permanent live, which took me about an hour dragging a, a new cable there from the airing cupboard. Take that out. It's perfectly fine to run it on three wires. So yeah, and now it works fine. So you learn something every day. You always get a bit nervous if you fit a boiler from brand new and something's wrong you think oh they're going to come out and they're going to say it's your fault they're going to charge you but he was absolutely fine i think valent are a great company to deal with um technical side so yeah that was that but yeah if you're fitting a heat only boiler to a gledil boiler mate um just be aware a lot of boiler manufacturers don't like them because they do have issues with them so yeah learn something new every day What's up guys, it's PB. Getting loads of questions about what you can get in these Van Volk sliders. So, standard DeWalt box. Won't go in vertical, will go on on its back, you'll get too high. Standard Milwaukee, again, won't go in vertical, will go in on its back, you might just get away with two. Standard Metabo, on its back, one high. Smaller kit boxes like the Nerad Tools Tapex kit and a Baco hole saw kit, will go in vertical and on their backs. Standard Festool, you'll get two of those in, the next size up you'll only get one in wider gear like this rems press tool won't go in width ways will go in length ways on its back same with the dewalt won't go in width ways will go in length ways and the double makita box won't go in width ways will go in length ways 
on its back you'll only get one in. Stuff that won't fit in, flute box, too tall, DeWalt T stack box, too tall. Hope this video has helped. Right, this was a funny job. So the customer called me up and told me that they'd got no heat or hot water. I inquired what boiler it was. They told me it was an ideal classic and straight away in my head I'm thinking it's probably the fan. So I asked them a couple of questions. Yeah, can't hear anything. The boiler's not even making a sound. So I said, yeah, it's probably the fan. I'll bring one with me. So I turned up with a fan. When I got here, just before, I took the case off, checked, was the power to the fan? No, there wasn't which means it's not a fan issue, it's a PCB issue. So all I did was check the leads on the PCB and I removed the one for the fan and put it back on and it started working. So it just goes to show, don't charge in like a bull in a china shop. Even though you might get Ideal Classic fans go all the time, just do your basic checks first because it was just a dry connection on the PCB that was the fault here. So all I needed to do on this one was just check the cable on the circuit board, check the voltage to the fan, and work out what the actual problem was. But yeah, just one of those things, dry connection, didn't need a part, got it working before I'd even finished my tea. This job been called in to service the gas fire. Now the first thing I noticed when I saw it was this little tube sticking down and on the top of the coals was this little disc saying that the chimney has got a chim sock installed into it. So basically this is like a big airbag You've probably been to properties before where they're not using the fire so to stop the draft they've stuck some newspapers up there or an old duvet or something like that. But this is a bag of air that blocks the chimney off when they're not using the fire. So I've come to service it, they've not used it luckily but the fire is still turned on, it's live so it could have been used. So what we're going to do now is let the air out of this unit and pull it out and then I'm going to do all my basic checks on the fire. So flu flow test, spillage test, have a look up there with the torch, nip outside, check the terminals of the right terminals, things like that. You'll do all this on your training when you go to do your ACS for gas fires. But don't very often see these, so there's a bit of a surprise to me. So once it's fully deflated, you can pull it out. And it, that's all it is really, just a bag of air that you pump up and it completely seals the chimney to stop any drafts for people who aren't using their fireplaces. What the danger is, things that fall down, birds can make nests and things like that, so you need to check the chimneys. So, I've done all my basic checks, got the fire working. Now you can see here, this is a 9.5 kilowatt input fire, which if you don't know, means it needs a vent. Basically, your fire burns the oxygen in the room, so if it's over a certain kilowattage, you need to provide extra fresh air, extra ventilation. So it's really important you check your vents because a lot of the time people will do this. And again, it's just because there's a draft. So they'll be sat in the house, they'll think, oh, it's really drafty coming from this vent, I'm gonna block it up. What they don't realize is if they're then using their gas fire, so for instance, Sunday afternoon, put a film on, it's a bit cold, so you put the gas fire on. You've got all the windows shut, all the doors are shut, you fall asleep that fire will burn all the oxygen in the room and then start producing carbon monoxide. So this is a really important thing to check. This next job I got called out to on a Saturday. There was a leak coming from the boiler. It was coming from the AAV bottle, the air admittance valve. 
just above the pump there. So to get them by the weekend, I screwed it down, but that didn't stop it leaking. So what I had to do was, you can see there, it's just the water's just started coming out again. Now, I could have left this turned off, um, because once I got it to stop leaking, that was fine. But it's not right. I know it's a part that's leaking, so it needs swapping. You can see there, the water's pouring out now. So to get them by over the weekend, what I did was I rolled up some PTFE, PTFE tape and I stuck it inside the cap there and I screwed it down really tight and that stopped, stopped it from dripping over the weekend. But we're going to stick a new one in now and it's a nice easy job on these Worcesters to swap this. Basically it just turns out. So if you'd never drained one of these boilers down before, this piece here is where you can drain the, the system from. Basically, you just want to attach your hose onto that and it turns. It's almost like a quarter turn. So what I'm going to do here is attach my hose and then run it down into a bucket and we can drain the system. So you can see here, if we just turn it, it's sort of a quarter turn like that and that's fully open now and that will let all that water out and drain the system so we can replace the part. So we've got the old air bottle out there, you can see there it's a bit, well, it's been leaking for a long time. We've got the new one here, it comes with an o-ring and it basically just sits in there and pushes in. What I will say is when you're swapping parts just check that the o-ring of the component you took out isn't still in the boiler because a lot of the time it will stay in the boiler rather than on the part. So this one here you can see it's got like a, a little wing on the side, there's one either side that sits in there, you push it down, you turn it to the right to lock it into place. So that's the new one fitted there. Take the hose off and repressurize the boiler. Now the thing with AAVs or air bottles on boilers is, a lot of people have different views on them. So when you're filling the boiler up for the first time, you have it open, it gets rid of the air. When you're draining down the boiler, you need to open it to let the air in, to let the water out. Some people will leave them open all the time to continuously passively remove air as and when or some people will once the system's full close it you know there's different reasons there's fors and against it i normally close them job done what's up guys it's pb just a really quick video on some boiler fault finding with ntc sensors or thermistors so you want to grab your multimeter change it to the ohm setting now mine's auto ranging, so that's all I've got to do, but yours you may need to set it manually and you want to be testing at around 20k. So on those two pins, we're getting the resistance of around 11,000 ohms, which is about room temperature, which is about right. If we warm the thermistor up, the resistance will decrease. And you can see now we're getting about 2,000 ohms. And as the thermistor cools down, the value increases and it will go all the way back up to room temperature. If we cool the thermistor down under a cold tap and get it nice and cold, the resistance will be higher. And you can see now when I test it, we've got about 14,000. If I put my body temperature on it, we're bringing it down again. And this is all it will do is the resistance will change according to what temperature it's reading. Hi hey guys, PB. So would you rather Wednesday with the difference this week? We're taking requests. Okay, this one's from David Lang. David wants to know, would you rather? Work with a guy, you get on all right with him, but he turns up two hours late. Gives you all the shitty jobs, lets you graft away while he's on his phone, messing about, and he always seems to get away with it. And then at the end of the day, he leaves at the same time as you do. Or would you rather work with someone that you really can't stand, you really don't get on with? What would you rather do? Plumber Centre have bought out a new own brand filter, but it's actually made by AD, and it's quite a nice little filter. Only, only place I will use it is when it's really tight and you need to service it from the front because it's a front facing filter. It's a brass body, plastic filter, but as I say, it's made by AD. So I fit one on this boiler. I'm just gonna show you a picture of it now and then I did a little video review of it when I got it for Instagram. Obviously, time will tell if it's any good. When I go back to service it next year, if it's been dripping, if it's I can't get it to bits, it's crap to service or whatever, I'll let you know. But for now, it seems like a decent little unit, 50 quid. Uh, as I say, front facing, good for a tight spot. The isolation valve on it, you can isolate the filter to service it, and it's an inline valve, so your heating will still work while you're servicing it, if you ever need to do that. But 
yeah, fitted one, here's a little video, and then in 12 months we'll know if they're any good or not. Hi guys, it's PB. If you're a tradesperson like me in the UK, you've probably been the victim of, or you're worried about being the victim of van tool theft. The perpetrators get a 60 to 80 pound fine for causing criminal damage, but I don't think that's enough, and I wanna do something about it. So on the 1st of November, I'm starting a campaign on social media called hashtag November to take a petition to government to get the courts to take this more seriously. It's not just criminal damage, they're affecting our ability to work and our ability to earn a living. Now there's a lot of petitions already out there, you may have even signed one or two of them, but they don't seem to be going anywhere. So on the 1st of November, join me, we're gonna all team together, this is gonna take all of us to get some notice and hopefully get something done.